All right, uh, we are going to start this evening's proceedings. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, for coming along uh, to another Thomson Reuters legal debate. My name is Axel Threlfall. Uh, I'm editor-at-large at Reuters. Uh, I'm going to be our debate chair this evening. Uh, that requires me, of course, to lay aside any uh, editorial uh, opinion and focus more on keeping our speakers to time and, importantly, uh, on topic. I, th I think it's fair to say, I don't know how many of y these you've been to, but I think it's fair to say we've had several speakers over the past few series who've quite, quite deftly, but not quite deftly enough, uh, broadened or massaged uh, the motion to better fit their, uh, their message. I'm not saying there's uh, any history of this sort of uh, devious behavior among our panel this evening. Far, far be it for me to suggest that, uh, that, that politicians or political aides or indeed barristers would indulge in, in such behavior. Um, a quick word on voting. Hopefully most of you will uh, already have cast your pre-debate vote on the iPad stations downstairs. Uh, if you haven't yet voted, please do so now. Uh, there you go. That is the, uh, the uh, information that you need up on the screens. I'm going to bring you the result of the pre-debate vote uh, in just a moment. And this is what makes this evening fun, actually. We hear what you think, we hear our speakers speak, and we see to what extent you've, uh, they've managed to sway uh, your opinion. Um, our motion tonight, a general election is the only way to resolve this country's current political crisis. <laughs> I, am, I was so tempted to, uh, to, uh, to, to given our lineup, to make a, a last minute change there. Perhaps we will get, get something uh, along the way linked to WTO sanctions, or, or I'm, I'm sure we can fit, squeeze, I'm sure Alistair or the Alistairs can squeeze Brexit into, uh, into uh, this somewhere. Um, instead, we're going for an equally topical uh, sanctions are fair and effective. Uh, it is a huge subject. Uh, it's an area that continues to generate a lot of heated discussion. Uh, it peppers the international news agenda uh, as well a lot at the moment, especially given the explosion, I think I'm right in saying, in the use of sanctions by the US administration and indeed uh, others. Uh, as is often the case, uh, some of you might well take issue with the exact wording of our motion. Uh, it is a broad one. Not all sanctions are the same or have the same goal or outcome. Uh, we, we all agree with that. And opinions may differ uh, on what is meant by fair uh, and effective. But I, I think we do need to try and avoid getting too bogged down uh, by this and think about some of the, the, the more general principles here. I, I was going to go into a little bit of detail on sanctions, where we got the effectiveness, where we got the fairness, but I'm going to leave that actually to our speakers because I don't want to sway anything uh, one way or the other with, with, with what I found as definitions uh, or not. Uh, our debaters are primed and ready to go. As usual, we've got two for, two against. Uh, they'll uh, uh, alternate opening statements before we open it up to uh, Q&A ahead of the closing statements and your chance to vote again. I'm just going to introduce them quickly, then we're going to hear the results of the pre-debate vote. Um, full bios, by the way, are on the website. Arguing for the motion that sanctions are fair and effective, Maya Lester, QC from Brick Court Chambers. Uh, Maya has expertise in a number of practice areas, including civil liberties and human rights and public international law and sanctions. The legal directories call her the queen of the sanctions bar without a doubt. So no pressure for you tonight, Maya. Um, also arguing for the motion, uh, the Right Honourable uh, the Lord Darling, who served as Chancellor uh, from 2007 to 2010. Uh, of course, as we all know, a, a critical period for the global economy. Uh, before uh, his life as a politician, Lord Darling uh, also worked as a solicitor in Edinburgh. As I said, full bios are on the website if you want them. Arguing against, Alistair Campbell, uh, journalist, broadcaster, author, best perhaps uh, uh, remembered uh, as Tony Blair's director of comms and strategy. Since then, among many other things, he has advised the Better Together campaign against uh, independence in Scotland and the Remain side in the referendum campaign. And arguing with Alistair uh, Campbell is Ben Emerson, QC at Moncton Chambers. Uh, like Maya, also works uh, across a range of, of disciplines, including public international law, commercial litigation, arbitration, and human rights law. Also an expert in domestic and international criminal law. I know I, I spoke very quickly there, but I wanted to get through that quite quickly. All right, Let, let's get the results of the, of the pre-debate vote. Let's put those up on the screen. The fours i.e. that sanctions are fair and effective. 59.3 is where we stand right now. The against 
Someone's going to have to do the maths for the undecideds there. But uh, the undecideds are the rest of you, so we can try and win you over. And in fact, I'm, I'm quite surprised, maybe you are too, that, that it's actually more even than I thought, uh, thought this was going to be. Um, let's hear from our speakers. First up, arguing for the motion from the podium here uh, is Maya Lester. Maya, you have eight to ten uh, uninterrupted minutes to do that from the podium. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a very important time for us to be debating the question, are sanctions fair and effective? Why, and I am sorry to do this in the opening sentence, but whether and how the UK leaves the European Union has crucial implications for the future of sanctions. At the moment, there is no such thing as United Kingdom sanctions. We apply sanctions that are imposed by the United Nations Security Council and by the European Union as part of its common foreign and security policy. And the United Kingdom has been extremely active in helping to shape those policies. But what we don't yet have is UK sanctions. If we leave the EU, we will start imposing sanctions ourselves, as a number of individual countries currently do, most obviously the United States of America, but there are many other countries that do so as well. We already have the legal powers, as most of you in this room will know, to start doing this in the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act 2018, the first piece of Brexit legislation that found its way through Parliament. And the government is currently drafting a report as we speak about how it intends to use its post-Brexit UK sanctions powers. It's been asked to do that by a committee of the House of Commons. So all of this means that the debate today is of central and timely importance. Are sanctions an effective and fair tool of foreign policy that the government should have ready in its toolbox? Or should they be thrown out for being ineffective and unfair, as Mr. Campbell and Mr. Emerson will suggest. This is one issue, at least, on which the government, all political parties, and both houses of parliament are united. All take the view that sanctions are essential to UK foreign policy, of course, as part of its wider foreign policy strategy. And I agree with this view. And not just as a debating point this evening, but after 20 years spent representing people and companies caught up with sanctions, either as the targets of sanctions or helping those trying to comply with the increasingly very complex international web of legal sanctions provisions. In my view, it is crucial to take away one key point in this debate, and that is this. Economic sanctions have undergone a revolution in the past 20 years. And in their new current form, they are highly potent, they can be extremely effective, they are carefully crafted to try to achieve the noblest of aims, and in most cases, they are pretty fair. Economic sanctions now are not recognizable as the same species as the blunt instrument trade boycotts of past decades. 20 years ago, the international community had basically lost faith in sanctions as an alternative to the use of force. We were burned by the United Nations blanket boycotts and trade embargoes on Iraq, Libya, Haiti, and Yugoslavia, for example. They seemed to many to result only in the enrichment of repressive leaders who were willing to let their own population suffer and endure massive humanitarian crisis rather than change their own policies. And the process for blacklisting individuals was Kafkaesque and lacking in even the most basic due process. But that was before the sanctions revolution, which I will now describe. First, and largely at the impetus of the Clinton and Obama uh, administrations in the US and since the 1990s, sanctions have become targeted. We no longer impose economic boycotts on countries or economies. We have so-called smart sanctions that are fairer and more effective 
by imposing economic and travel restrictions only on those who are actually responsible for the behavior being targeted with the aim of persuading them to change their behavior or at least to make life much more difficult for them, to constrain their conduct and to send an international message of condemnation. The United Nations, the European Union and the US and in the future the United Kingdom all use these list-based sanctions to target first of all terrorists and those that support and finance terrorism. These lists of course grew enormously after 9-11. People responsible for global corruption and serious human rights violations. These now include the Russian nationals responsible for the Skripal poisonings in Salisbury and for the death of the lawyer Sergei Magnitsky who was murdered for uncovering fraud in the Kremlin, and the Saudi nationals responsible for the death of Jamal Kagoshi. They are also used to target global traffickers in narcotics and conflict diamonds, and the leaders and supporters of the repressive regimes of Assad in Syria, Maduro in Venezuela, and many others. The EU to this list has recently also added cyber and chemical <coughs> weapons uh, attacks. A second example, the first was targeting. A second example of these new fairer and more targeted measures are sectoral sanctions. When President Putin invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea in 2014, rather than a military response or a trade boycott, the United States and the European Union imposed carefully calibrated multinational restrictions on the Russian state and state-owned companies that were designed to impose pressure on the precise sectors the Russian state depends on. The energy sector, on Arctic drilling, shale gas extraction, the defense sector, and access to EU and US capital markets. Now one can't of course know what President Putin would have done had sanctions not been imposed. The counterfactual is impossible to know but I shudder to think. A third example, and the most powerful of all in the new sanctions armory, are the so-called US secondary sanctions, which harness the global power of the dollar in a new form of financial warfare. The effect of secondary sanctions, for those of you that don't know, <coughs> is not only that you cannot do business with the US if you are the target of US sanctions, but anyone, anywhere in the world that does business with a person or company that the US has sanctioned may themselves be cut off from US financial markets altogether. And that, of, of course, is a price thought by almost no one to be worth paying. Now, of course, sanctions, even of this new and potent kind, cannot solve the key national security and foreign policy crises of our day overnight any more than any other foreign policy tool can do so. But what is absolutely clear is that these new kinds of sanctions can pack a serious punch when it comes to constraining behavior and simply making life much more difficult for the targets. They are extremely broad restrictions on making funds or resources of any kind available to the targets, which makes it impossible for them to hold a bank account, travel or conduct international business. My, you've gone eight minutes, you've got two to go, maximum two. There is very active involvement, particularly by the US authorities who have imposed eye-watering fines on European banks for breach, and the vast industry of compliance departments in every business is testament to the impact of these measures. Moreover, the eagerness of some of their targets to have the sanctions lifted surely strongly suggests that they have a serious impact. We know, for example, from Robert Mueller's report how, easy pre how eager President Putin was to beat down President Trump's door and try to persuade him to lift US sanctions on Russia. And even today, of course, President Rouhani of Iran is begging the EU to try to counter the effects of the US re-imposition of sanctions. Finally, what then about the fairness of these new measures? Again, all of this has changed in part as a result of litigation in the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. Those courts have made very clear that in the EU, we believe in the rule of law, which means that far-reaching restrictions of this kind must comply with basic due process. As a result, whatever sanctions list you are on, you will have the basic safeguards. You will know the reasons for your listing, the evidence against you, 
There are exceptions and authorizations for the use of funds for basic needs. And you can make represent representations to the authorities on your delisting, in many cases successfully. You also have the right to judicial review of your listing. Now, none of this is perfect, and in particular, anticipating a point Mr. Emerson, I imagine, will make, the United Nations system for imposing sanctions is in need of serious reform. I'm pleased to say that the UK, who has been at the forefront of ensuring due process in <coughs> sanctions listings, has included safeguards in the Sanctions Act a, to try to ensure mine. their fairness. Got a wrap. Um, but the need for further reform, particularly at UN level, does not make sanctions as a whole unfair, any more than the fact that sanctions can't rid the world of terrorism, repression and corruption makes them ineffective. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, sanctions in their modern form are effective and are fair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Maya. Sorry I had to rush you there at the end. I'm being strict with everyone this evening. Um, Maya Lester, thank you very much. Right, up next is Alistair Campbell, who is arguing uh, against uh, the motion. Alistair, as soon as you get up there, hit start, and your 8 to 10 uh, starts then. Yeah, and uh, you won't be able to see, so I can actually I've go, got it right go here for as long as I want. Uh, right, OK. Now, look, I think one of the problems with the modern world is a modern media, modern politics, is the curse of what I call something must be done-itis. And on the international scene, sanctions all too often are the go-to fallback for that case. Something must be done to stop a frenzy, to calm a media storm. Hit them with sanctions. That will show them. And it might help the storm to subside. It will lead the news. It will allow presidents and prime ministers to stand at lecterns like this and look and sound tough. But often, all too often, by the time the sanctions have worked their way through the system, the media's lost interest, the politicians have moved on, and it's left to think tanks, historians, and above all, people who are affected by them to make an assessment of whether the something that's been done was done well. Now, they work if your only calculation for their effectiveness is economic degradation. Sanctions lead to an average 25.5% decline in GDP per capita of sanctioned countries. But does that help or hinder the political and diplomatic objectives behind the sanctions? That is the more important question. Now, unlike the leader of the party I've supported all my life, from which I was recently expelled, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot claim to have any particular fondness for the state of Venezuela. I do have a certain respect for the Center for Economic Policy Research and their assessment of the smart sanctions regime that has been inflicted upon Venezuela is that they've reduced the public's calorif calorific intake, they've increased disease and mortality, they've displaced millions of Venezuelans who've fled depression and hyperinflation. Most of the impact of these sanctions has not been on the government but on the civilian population, disproportionately harming the poorest and most vulnerable, including more than 40,000 deaths in the last two years, these last two years. And they argue that those sanctions fit the definition of, quotes, collective punishment of the civilian population, which is actually against the Geneva and Hague International Conventions, to which America is a signatory. So the poor got hit the hardest. The powerful stayed in power. And in being illegal, violating US law as well, they turned the people not against the regime, but against those doing the punishing. At the other end of the economic scale, take the blockade imposed on Qatar by Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt since June 2017. If anything, it seems to have boosted the emir's popularity and led the population to rally behind him. Again, the strong get stronger, the weak get weaker. Now, possibly one day, North Korea, Cuba, Myanmar will become great beacons of liberty, and we'll all be able to say sanctions played their part in helping deliver freedom. Thus far, I would argue they're having the opposite effect. And there's a reason for this. In regimes 
where political decision making is not democratic, there is no pathway through which civilian pressure can bring about change in the government. So the democracies imposing the sanctions imagine the people there will behave as our people might, but they won't because they can't. Or take this report from the RAND Corporation published by the World Economic Forum. Economic sanctions, it argues, have a lot in common with carpet bombing. They are indiscriminate, damage disproportionately the most vulnerable, and seldom have the desired effect unless followed up with a military invasion. And I think it's very hard to talk about smart sanctions when the bulk of them are imposed by the American government and the current president is Donald Trump. On the military, Haiti in 94, Bosnia 95, Kosovo 99, Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003. Sanctions were tried, failed, military action followed. And I guess we could argue it showed the international community trying to avoid war. But what happens when the military intervention fails or is never tried? Then you have the perpetuation of sanctions unlinked to any attainable objective, and it risks becoming purely punitive and vindictive. Cuba, 60 years of economic sanctions failed to shorten the reign of Castro, his brother, or their successors by a single day. Syria, once Obama withdrew American support from the insurgent opponents of Assad in 2016, since then, They've abandoned even the call for Assad to step down, yet without let up on sanctions. Now, sanctions, supporters of sanctions, I think, they tend to argue that they're effective in containing nuclear proliferation. But here, too, I think the record is demonstrably poor. Since the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970, the four countries that have made the most progress towards acquiring nuclear weapons, Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Three of them did so whilst under sanctions. Not very effective. I might concede sanctions helped play a part in South Africa in <coughs> delivering the end to the apartheid regi regime, but I would also argue that soft power, especially people power and protest around the world, did as much as hard power to end apartheid. Now, Trump. The sanctions imposed at the moment on Iran They've begun to bite economically. Inflation has returned with a vengeance, 31%. According to the IMF, the economy is poised to shrink by 6% this year and inflation to rise even further to 37%. So they're working, says Trump, because they're having the desired effect. But again, it's a desired effect on the economy. Is it having the desired effect on the regime and the people of Iran. On the contrary, I suspect the opposite. And though I like and admire Bill Clinton in a way I could never like or admire Trump, his record on this is not as great as mine might suggest. Of the 67 cases in the 90s, two thirds were unilateral sanctions imposed by the US. And during his presidency, around 40% of the world's population was subject to some form of US sanction. And currently the US has almost 8,000 sanctions in place with Iran by far the largest state. All fine if they are effective, but they're not. And I know thanks to Mr. Gove, <coughs> we're expected to dismiss experts, but just as I want a doctor to treat my illness and a qualified pilot to fly my plane, I like people who devote their whole lives to a narrow field of expertise. So finally, I want to quote the Peterson Institute for International Economics, who've analyzed in detail 170 sets of sanctions and concluded that one third attained their stated objective. I think there is a moral, emotional, but also empirical statistical argument against many of the sanctions that have been inflicted upon countries around the world. They have a better reputation than they deserve. And sometimes when we're thinking something must be done, sometimes the best something is nothing too dramatic. Wait, pressurize, diplomatize,
It makes for boring politics and an even more querulous media, but they move on. So what? If the something being done is the wrong thing, better sometimes to do nothing at all. And my final point, I'd say that the eight minutes, 40 seconds I've spoken is the longest I've gone since June the 24th, 2013, without mentioning Brexit. <laughs> so I just want finally to say <laughs> yeah. that one of the reasons, I think, why the country is failing to unite around any vision of Brexit is because it's actually the first known case in history of a country imposing sanctions on itself. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. <clears throat> We're, we'll allow you that last bit. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Alistair. All right, Alistair Darling uh, is arguing for the motion. Well, let me start by saying that I agree with the last paragraph of Alistair's speech, every last word of it. <clears throat> and I promise you that um, I won't return to Brexit, to Brexit until near the end of my remarks, when inevitably it will uh, crop up. Now, let me just start by um, saying this, that when I was asked to speak in this debate, I was about to uh, give evidence in a case that involves sanctions that I had authorized when I was Chancellor of the Exchequer against an Iranian bank. And I thought they were fair and effective, and they were fair and effective when I left office, but unfortunately someone took the case to the Supreme Court, which found against me and said it was unfair because I had sanctioned one bank rather than all Iranian banks. And I thought it was should it must be the opposite. How can you sanction every bank, whether or not you've got any evidence, when you've got evidence against one bank? So I did feel slightly strongly about it. I mean, the case actually settled, um, uh, so I never did have to give evidence, and something I'm quite glad of, since although I was a lawyer, I've never actually appeared in a witness box, um, and I wish to maintain that case. But let me just make this case. I don't argue that all sanctions are fair that all sanctions are effective because inevitably, like any other diplomatic uh, tool, some will succeed, some won't. And I certainly don't argue that whenever a problem arises, either something must be done or that if you're going to do something, that it's got to be sanctions because diplomacy, one hopes, uh, still has its role. There'll be other measures uh, that you'd want to take. And you know, frankly, when it comes to harming ordinary people, uh, and I think all our experience is that uh, whether it's sanctions or whether it's military force, it is very often people who've got nothing whatsoever to do with the causes of whatever the complaint is uh, that get, get hurt and very badly. So I don't argue, we don't argue uh, that sanctions are always uh, the first port of call that will always work. And I appreciate Alistair makes a fair point here uh, that in relation to the people who are behind them, whenever you start an argument that says Donald Trump says or Boris Johnson says, I appreciate you certainly start a long way back from where you want to be uh, in making your argument. Uh, Maya has made an important point, uh, which, you know, which I won't repeat, but it is worth bear your bearing in mind, and that is that the sanctions regimes have changed, and they do alter behavior. Because when you get sanctions imposed on, say, a bank uh, that uh, effectively stop other banks or other institutions having dealings with it, the, the repercussions for that bank and that country can be quite far-ranging, and equally, when you can actually impose sanctions on individuals, the people who are perhaps the author, the cause of uh, the behavior that you're complaining about, uh, then they can be very uh, fair and they can also be effective. But I repeat the point, nobody is saying that it's the only thing you can do and nobody could certainly argue that they will always work. But I want to make three basic points, three propositions if you like. The first is that in any uh, society in the world, and relations between countries, you need rules. Rules about what's acceptable and what's not. It's easily forgotten today, I know that, and that's an important point. But you do need rules, and if you've got rules, and if those rules are broken, whether it's in conduct or relations, whatever, then you've got to have some sort of remedy. Now, it may be that in some cases where you let the situation run and see what you can do, and, or you may decide that if you do something, a greater harm will be created. But equally, surely you want to avoid getting yourself into a situation where the only alternative <laughs> is force. Which brings me to the second point. If you decide that you're not going to have sanctions, then all too easily that means you're going to end up sooner rather than later resorting to force. Now, 
Iraq is within recent memory. Alistair and I have e experience of that. You know, when uh, sanctions are apparently not working, you then turn to force. Look at the consequences of that all these years uh, that, that followed. It's, it, it, to my mind, to turn your back against imposing sanctions with the imperfections we know about and to rely on force would be disastrous. It is morally reprehensible, yes, to target people who are wholly innocent, but it's equally morally represent, representable to unjustify uh, and unleash a force against them which will result in their death or injury. So, of course, uh, sanctions are not the only thing that you want to deploy, but they are far, far better than the use of force. And, you know, we should remember it's 80 years ago yesterday uh, since uh, the outbreak of the Second World War. We don't want to return to that. The third point is, I think, a political question, because the issue before us today, uh, to my mind, isn't so much whether we should get rid of sanctions or not, and that is a rather more fundamental problem. Do we internationally believe in the idea of there being rules by which we conduct our affairs and we live? And are we prepared to support the institutions that we have relied upon, largely since the end of the Second World War, like the United Nations, to enforce them? Because that is, in, that is what is in question today. <coughs> Now, I think that if you look at uh, the, 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 these points, we do need uh, to continue with uh, sanctions uh, where it's appropriate. I'm particularly attracted to those that are more focused, as I said, on individuals, the bad actors, if you like. Uh, they're probably more effective in many ways because that you hit the controlling mind of the people responsible for these actions. But sanctions you know, have played a role. We, um, Alistair talked about Iran. There's no doubt the sanctioned regime helped Iran get into a place where it was prepared to negotiate. This is pre-Trump and the uh, to, to limit uh, the production of nuclear arms. Obviously, Trump said at the outset he was going to undo that, and we're in a different situation today. But in relation to Russia, there's no doubt that the sanctions there, particularly against the individuals, is having an effect because the oligarchs don't like it. And they can work. South Africa, I mentioned Iran. Um, uh, th there's no doubt they can work if they are properly, properly applied. As I said, it is much better than the alternative. No one in their right mind, uh, you would throw away what sanctions there are against North Korea and, and decide in to instead to embark on use of force because the consequences would be absolutely horrific. And equally, in terms of process, uh, I quite accept that more has to be done to make them fairer, to deal with some of the, uh, uh, the, the legitimate criticisms that are being made. But here, I do want to make an important point. <coughs> Sanctions will really only work if it is done as part of the international community. If whether it's the United Nations, whether it's the European Union, it can be effective. I wonder if we reach the post-Brexit world, how effective sanctions are in one particular country. Uh, I, I find it inconceivable that we would sort of go it alone while the rest of the world was doing uh, some, something different. And I think that is something that we as a country will need to ponder on. But I want to conclude by just making the point that I touched on earlier. I think the biggest problem we have now is not whether or not we get rid of sanctions. It's whether we're prepared to live by rules. And, you know, that can be applied internationally as well as here at home. Live by rules and see them enforced and whether or not we still value institutions that up until very recently were respected, they've had their imperfections, we know the, the politics of all this, but when people start trashing those institutions that were set up to uh, police the world, when they call into question things that are being done, you've got to think, where is that going to take us? And, you know, in the world in which we live at the present time, uh, when there are few reasons to be optimistic in the world outlook for many, many reasons, and I think that is something that we need to concentrate on. So what I ask you tonight is, uh, think long and hard before you vote for a proposition that said that sanctions are effectively uh, to be put to one side. And think very carefully, if you do that, where it takes you. And as I say, think about the bigger picture here. We may live in dark times, you know, whether it's here, in Europe, in other parts of the world. Uh, but unless people who do think there is a better way forward begin to speak out and are prepared to take action, uh, then I fear the environment which we live in at the present time is likely to continue for many, many years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much indeed, Alistair Darling. Uh, and just to finish up with um, our final speaker, Ben Emerson from uh, Moncton Chambers, uh, and then we're going to open this up to uh, some questions and answers for...
a, a few minutes. So have, have a think. It's also going to give them an opportunity to have a go at each other a little bit. Uh, you got that, Ben? I'm just trying to make this thing start. There we go. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> let's take stock of where we've got to in the course of the discussion this evening. First of all, <clears throat> uh, we're all agreed, I'm sure, that as the only instrument that sits between diplomacy and armed force, it would be a good thing to have a sanctions regime that was fair and effective. But that, of course, is not the question tonight. The question is whether current sanctions practice meets uh, those two standard tests. Secondly, stock taking. Broadly, there are two categories of sanctions. There are sanctions uh, imposed unilaterally either by an individual state or by a group of states like the European Union, but not universal. So they're patchy in their application. The smaller the number of states, the more patchy they are, the less effective they are. Uh, as Lord Darling uh, just said, he questions whether unilateral sanctions by the United Kingdom or any other state are really truly effective. What sanctions have to be in order to meet the other side of the motion's own test is universal, implemented by the United Nations, implemented uh, across the globe. In the course of what he said to you uh, on this side of the motion, Alistair Campbell was emphasizing the really damaging humanitarian consequences of essentially unilateral sanctions. What I want to focus on is the array of international sanctions imposed by the United Nations Security Council acting under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And uh, as Lord Darling rightly says, you would expect those regimes inevitably to be the most effective because they impose obligations on all member states of the UN. The, the obligation on a UN member state to obey a resolution of the Security Council trumps every other treaty obligation that state might have including its human rights treaty obligations, such as the obligations arising under the European Convention on Human Rights. If the Security Council passes a Chapter 7 sanctions resolution, then all states must obey it, uh, even if that would violate their human rights uh, obligations. And since they have a global impact, those must be surely the most effective. Uh, but are they fair? And the answer to that question, I'm going to invite you to say, is a categorical no. They are substantively unfair in the sense that they're unfairly targeted at weaker states in the international political order. And they are procedurally unfair in the sense that they operate in a due process wasteland for those individuals and entities that are targeted uh, within uh, any particular state's targeted sanctions regime. So let me start with substantive unfairness. Like all decisions of the Security Council, sanctions are caught in an ossified power structure. Fifteen states on the Security Council rotating, but the real decision-making power rests with the permanent five, the P5, the United Kingdom, the United States, Russia, China, and France. They are the key to any effective global sanctions, and in fact, any other measure adopted by the Security Council. Why? Because those states alone have a permanent right to veto any affirmative action that the state, that the Security Council might wish to take, any one of them, at any time, on any issue. Why are they given special status? You might assume that the membership of the P5 reflects some conception of the global balance of power in the world. But actually its historical significance is, is purely uh, that these were the powers that formed the anti-fascist alliance uh, that beat the Axis powers in the Second World War led by Germany uh, and Japan. We are subject to a global regime of decision-making uh, that is governed by a, a power structure ossified in 1945, 75 years ago, before even the Cold War uh, 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 <coughs> took place. And yet these five states uh, enjoy, for that purely historical reason, 
remarkably privileged status on the, uh, 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 on the Security Council. So pausing there, Chapter 7 of the Charter is the only mechanism in the world by which effective sanctions, that is to say global <coughs> universal sanctions, can ever be imposed. And yet, uh, it is imposed, or they are imposed, subject uh, to an asymmetrical power structure uh, in which uh, a, a, a political and military alliance forged in the furnace of a war 75 years ago determines whether or not any measure before the Security Council gets through. So you obviously won't find the Security Council imposing sanctions on China for imprisoning more than a million Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps in Xinjiang province, or for its bellicose conduct in the South China Seas, or for its outrageous treatment towards Tibet and Taiwan, or for the brutal crackdown that is almost certainly imminent in Hong Kong uh, as we speak. As a member of the P5, China is exempt from global sanctions. Simple as that. Uh, despite what you've heard about Magnitsky sanctions and the, the, the Scripple case, the same is true of Russia. You won't find the Security Council, the only body that can impose effective global sanctions, ever imposing sanctions on Russia for its persecution of the Tatar Muslim population of Crimea, for its attempts to destabilize Western democracies through election manipulation or, uh, dare I say it, manipulating referendums. You won't find um, uh, uh, sanctions imposed by the Security Council for Russia's consistent pattern uh, of homicidal targeted assassinations of the enemies of Vladimir Putin wherever they're to be found any in the in the world. You won't find the Security Council imposing sanctions against Russia for its sponsorship of the paramilitary forces waging a bloody trench warfare in eastern Ukraine, despite the fact that those forces are undeniably responsible for shooting down uh, the Dutch passenger aircraft MH17, killing all passengers on board. No, uh, no sanctions in respect of, of that conduct. It's true, uh, as Meyer says, that the European Union did impose sanctions on Russia for its unlawful occupation uh, of Crimea, uh, but those, as we said earlier on, are not universal sanctions, they are not effective, and they have done nothing uh, to uh, change Putin's policies towards Ukraine. Uh, it's also true uh, that the UN General Assembly has condemned Russia's conduct in Ukraine, because the General Assembly adopts resolutions by a majority, and no state has a veto. Uh, that power, though, to impose sanctions is not one that is available to the General Assembly. It is reserved to the Security Council with its ossified asymmetrical decision-making structure. So the first and absolutely central unfairness in the entire system is that it leaves two of the world's worst human rights violators, China and Russia, uh, entirely shielded from the consequences of their actions, <coughs> even where they act in flagrant violation uh, of international law. But the problem uh, runs deeper even than that. Any state who's a friend or ally among the P5 uh, can almost certainly rely on the protection of the veto as well. Allies of Russia and China are never going to be sanctioned at the UN. In fact, any country that has a valuable or a valued trading relationship with any one of the countries that won the Second World War is unlikely to be subjected to sanctions at the United Nations level, however outrageously it violates international law. Uh, nor will the UN impose sanctions on countries who have large-scale economic markets that one of the P5 wants to exploit. So <clears throat> we're never going to see Security Council sanctions against India for violating international law through its revocation of the status, autonomous status of Jammu Kashmir last month or for the resulting security crackdown on the Muslim community, which has seen more than 4,000 people indefinitely detained, numerous reports of torture and other forms of abuse by the Indian security You've service. got about 30 seconds, by the way, Ben. Uh, um, I think the point is clear. Um, because of the size of the population of countries like that, because of the trading power of countries like Saudi Arabia, it is never going to be the countries that pose the greatest threat 
It's never going to be the countries that pose the greatest human rights uh, threat, humanitarian threat, or indeed threat to international peace and security that are the subject of the most effective form of sanctions. It's the weaker states, the failed or failing states with no friends in the P5 who don't have big enough markets to attract their interest. And if that's the standard by which effective sanctions are judged, what's fair about that? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to uh, to all of our uh, all of our speakers. And you were making copious notes, so hopefully you'll have a, a go at each other in, in just a second. We've got a, we've got ten minutes or so for some questions, and I, I do want to open it up to questions. This is often um, the the really the the the, the, the time the part of. <laughs> I wasn't going to say the interesting bit. And we could also ask, you know, I'm, I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth. I'd like to know as well from our speakers <coughs> who, who argued their cases brilliantly, actually whether they really truly believe in uh, the, the side they argued. But we can leave that until the end. Yeah. Um, all right, come on, let's have some questions. Yeah, lady in the front here. We, we do have a mic. We're just going to come to you. And, uh... <coughs> thank you. And thank you, all the speakers, for. Um, your comments. Um, I read today that the Armenian Prime Minister, Nikol Pashinyan, has been given assurances by the states that they're not really going to enforce any US sanctions on them if they continue to deal with Iran, because Iran is one of only two out of their four borders that are open to them. Doesn't that suggest that the impact on sanctions on Iran has unfair effects on other countries that are not in the B5 or are not as um, well supported and recognize the fact that that is de facto unfair, because the impact of the sanctions go much further than the intended um, targets, such as Iran. Is it? I don't know. You want to take well, it? You know, I, you know, I said at the outset, <coughs> I um, would never seek to argue that all sanctions are effective and fair. And you know, listening to Ben, he, there, we, it was a masterful crit critique of the United Nations why the, the P5 is what it is, and the unfairness and the point he makes about you know, relationships and so on. But it still doesn't get you around the problem. <coughs> if you decide that sanctions are off the agenda and trying to right wrongs, then where does it take you? Because you either have to rely on going and having a cup of tea with these people and saying, you know, come on, let's be grown up and be nice to each other, which you know, really doesn't work. Um, or you have to have the threat of something. Now, I, you know, if the proposition was that you know uh, we believe that the United Nations needs reform, you know, there are hundred percent votes. I expect. Uh, I suppose my worry is that far from discussing the efficacy of sanctions, the, the the mood generally in the world, and especially amongst the five that he mentioned about my, the three of them, is frankly they don't really want the institution at all because it gets in the way. You know, <coughs> so uh, you know I understand the point you're making about fairness, but the proposition tonight effectively is if you, re if you believe that they're not fair, they're not effective, they're off the agenda, where does that take you? No, so we, we were not saying they should be off the agenda. Well, where would they be going then? Well, they're part of the agenda, but, but the point I think both of us were making was that, that, that they are too easily and too quickly gone to without thinking through consequences. Such yeah, as but I, I, go on. So also, I just, I just say that the, the, the mere fact that there's a case for having a sanctions option doesn't tell us whether they're fair and effective. And you take the example of, of Armenia and, and, um, and Iran. The real iniquity in the, in, the, in the sanctions against Iran is that they were agreed at United Nations Security Council level as part of a denuclearization deal. And Donald Trump just decided, as the only country in the world which has the power to do this, to simply ignore a Security Council resolution. So in reimposing those sanctions, that's just an example of how even where the United Nations has done the right thing, it's just ignored you know, by states like uh, the US. You know, uh, you know, I said right at the start that I accept that, you can, that in many <coughs> cases you can say these are not fair, they're not well thought out and the rest of it. Um, but well, give I, us, an, I, example, I, give us an example of where a, a, a sanctions have been imposed upon a country and the impact has been totally aligned with the political or diplomatic objective. Well, I, I don't... Uh, it's very difficult to prove that something is ever totally aligned no, there. You can give but, it up but, a go. What, no, what, what I can say is that, if you, going back to the Iran, I, but part of the reason that Iran came to the table pre-Trump was because sanctions were having an effect on it. 
Now, that, to my mind, was much better than the alternative of using force or, or, or whatever. Equally, you know, we know that the individual sanctions imposed on some of the, people, the oligarchs in, in Russia and so on is bothersome and irksome to them. And you know, who knows, we'll have some pressure. But, 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 but I, I, I didn't suggest that it did. But if you get yourself into a situation where you say, well, we're not going to do that, because you know, too often they're going to be unfair. I'm not arguing, here's a sanction, it's unfair, we're jolly good, I'm going to go ahead with it. I'm not arguing that at all. I just think you make a huge mistake, and in pres especially in the climate we face today, and in the world in which we live today, if you say, OK, we're not going to do sanctions. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> Mark, you want to say something? Well, I mean, I think the idea that sanctions can only be effective if they achieve exactly what their initial objective, as it were, stated on the tin was, is, is completely misconceived. Why can't it be an effective byproduct of sanctions that the international community is sending a crucial signal that this kind of conduct simply will not be condoned? So with great respect, your answer is, well, we should simply sit back and wait. But in the examples that Ben Emerson gives of completely outrageous conduct by a number of actors around the world who he's quite right to say will never be sanctioned by the Security Council, why should it be that the European Union or the United States or whoever the actor is should do nothing? Why is it not part of effectiveness to say, first of all, we send an extremely strong sig signal mm -hmm. by the international community, and secondly, that even if we think we can't change conduct, we can't enact regime change, that we might make life for the kleptocrats much, much That's, more difficult. Yeah, and might, it, and the might. idea, just one more point, yeah. the idea that the only <coughs> effective sanctions are the worldwide United Nations sanctions in the current climate seems to me to be completely out of line with what the business community in this room will be thinking, which is that the sanctions regimes which strike fear into the heart of people in this room are United, Nations, uh, are United States unilateral sanctions. Why? Because of the point I made at the outset, modern sanctions harness <coughs> the dollar. What they do is they attach conditions to the use of financial markets. They're not about having 200 nations freezing assets. They're about saying, if you want to do business, if you want to use the dollar, then you comply with our human rights standards. And that is as true of President Trump, as it, of whom I'm obviously no fan, as it was of President Obama <coughs> and Clinton. But no, 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 nonetheless, if the example that's being held up of sanctions or secondary sanctions that are capable of influencing the, not the behavior no one really cares about the behavior of honest companies doing business that's not the objective the objective is to change the behavior of despots or others who are abusing power and, and those companies are suffering in the meantime the consequences of that because they're being used as leverage but get the prime mover in that field is the united states no, no one no one better no one stronger and yet, and yet, what example is being set when the global community agrees with Iran to do a deal to denuclearize on the basis of everybody then suspending sanctions progressively, and the United States comes along with a great big stick and says, I don't care right. what's been agreed, <coughs> I'm tearing the agreement up. All I, mean, right. I mean, maybe we'll get a sense of what people in the room think, but yeah, uh, lady here and then gentleman next to you. Yeah, let's start with it. <coughs> And this is a question to Ben and um, Alistair Campbell. Um, I uh, heard your argument, very well made, but um, at the moment I'm dithering, but I'm trying to understand when you say that sanctions don't work, they're not fair and effective, what alternative are you putting forward um, in respect of the argument that Alistair um, Darling makes in terms of when somebody breaks the rules, what, what happens? More what do you, fair what, and what more, do you say? more effective. Sanctions that are a sanctions practice that meets the standard of fairness and but that how, is carefully you... tailored in order to achieve an effective result. The question we look we're addressing tonight is does current sanctions practice no, 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 do it's that? The question is not do current <laughs> sanctions. Not could they ever Listen, be, but I, are they? I agree are they? I agree with you that, that it would be, that it would be much better if we work to get the uh, you know, extremely effective, extremely <coughs> targeted um, sanctions. What I can't buy is the argument because there are imperfections, which of which none of us would disagree. Therefore, you decide to junk the whole thing. Well, nobody's saying we junk the whole thing. But I, 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 I'll, give, I'll give you an example. I, I, you, there's lots of talk here about Putin, okay? 
And Ben talked about Putin in the context of the United Nations Security Council resolution, and he's absolutely right in what he said about that. And you've talked about Putin in, in relation to smart sanctions and, and, and against oligarchs. Now, I would say that, I mean, I have got no time for these oligarchs whatsoever, and I love the fact that Roman Abramovich can't get into Britain because I think his football club stinks. <laughs> However, <laughs> yeah. I, I, but I do say, it, it, so that I think it makes people feel better. When we're talking about whether they're effective, what was the purpose of those sanctions? If the purpose of those sanctions is actually to send a message to Vladimir Putin, I don't think it has any effect at all. So you've got to, if you're being serious about sending a political, diplomatic message to Vladimir Putin, then it's not about messing around with a few of his oligarchs when he's got plenty more where they came from. And I think that you, you mentioned Salisbury. We just, have to, we just have to accept certain realities. What happened in Salisbury? Let's just be clear about this. Vladimir Putin and his people ordered the killing of citizens, Russian citizens, <coughs> in, on the British streets and thereby putting at risk British lives and p indeed somebody lost their life. And what could we actually do after that? There's no way in the world that Britain is going to go to war with the Soviet right. Union. And therefore, they decided <coughs> something must be done. We'll do a bit of sanctions. It's had no effect whatsoever so what, what would you have done? on the issue. I think you sh they should have been far tougher in relation to Putin himself. If you're going to be really serious about that, you target Putin, not the people around him about whom he couldn't give a damn. And no one mentioned the Burnley result on Saturday. Um, <laughs> sorry, Alistair. Uh, yeah, you can resist. Go ahead. It strikes me from what we've been hearing on both sides that, this, that sanctions appear to be a weapon in an armory. And in fact, they are a necessary evil, if you like, a bit like austerity. Nobody likes austerity. Nobody likes sanctions. But I think they are part of an armory yeah, and they that. have to be used as effectively as possible. But right now, I think neither they are, they are neither fair nor effective. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, yep, yeah, right at the back there. You've mentioned the uh, US sanctions and the UN Security Council, but I'd be interested to hear about the presenters' views about the Arab League, because they also have the ability to um, impose sanctions on a regional and a global basis, I believe. Mm. Ben, you want to say that? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the regional sanctions regimes are subject to all of the same effectiveness challenges as the EU sanctions regime, but without the benefit of an extremely sophisticated jurisdiction within the EU designed to challenge EU measures which give effect to those regimes. So, I mean, it, it, you, in a way, one needs to focus on the best of the worst in order to decide whether to answer the question effectively. I mean, very interestingly, we've, talked, uh, we've heard Maya talk about how sanctions have been greatly improved uh, over, over the last 20 years, and in particular, uh, counter-terrorism sanctions have been greatly improved, and they, they, they have to a degree, there's been an increase to some extent in the procedural justice because those re regimes have now an ombudsperson you can apply to. But the reason why uh, they have an ombudsperson that you can apply to is because a team of brilliant British lawyers went to the European uh, Court of Justice and slammed the United Nations sanctions regimes for being grotesquely unfair and unfit uh, for an international institution. That team was driven by Maya Lester uh, and she had a fantastic result in achieving, in achieving a recognition globally of just how appalling sanctions practice has become was whether uh, 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 what, what, what the EU did, uh, I'm sorry, what the, what the UN did in terms of putting that right enough, the answer is absolutely not. I was brought in uh, when I was UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights to do an investigation into the fairness and human rights compatibility of the sanctions regime for terrorism. Uh, and what I found was truly appalling. Uh, you have states horse trading with other states, uh, doing political deals to get people onto the lists, 
you have an ombudsperson who can do no more than recommend their removal, you have people being put on the list without <coughs> even a, a, a proper scrutiny of the evidence, where evidence obtained by torture is admissible, and in circumstances where there's absolutely no duty on the state nominating somebody to disclose evidence tending to show that they're innocent. All right. All right, Ben, thank you. And, and by the way, just, I, I know you mentioned Maya, but your final vote is based on what you hear our speakers say this evening. <laughs> That's important, I think, now. Um, let's have one more, a couple more questions, and then we've got to uh, hear the final uh, statement. Yeah, right here. Going back to the effectiveness, isn't it the case the, to measure effectiveness, isn't it what basically the US wants, and we just have to follow? Going back to Maya's point about how, the power of the US dollar. Sorry, did you, I didn't hear can the you question. Just repeat the question. So the, effectiveness of, the effectiveness of sanctions can only be measured what the US actually wants it to be. Yeah. Is, isn't that the case, really, in reality? No, I think, I think that part of the measure of the effectiveness of sanctions, have they worked, is what the stated intention is. And with great respect, it's not right what some of our previous speakers have suggested, that sanctions are not now clearly marked to certain attainable goals. So, they are, it's whether they're achieved. So in, in the case of Russia sanctions, which has been talked a lot about, what is now clearly stated is if the Minsk agreements are fulfilled, sanctions will be lifted. The case of Iran has been re repeatedly mentioned. That was a classic case where the deal was done on the basis that if uh, sanctions are lifted, then Iran will permit really quite intrusive inspections and reductions in nuclear enrichment capabilities. Now, the fact that the United States has pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal does not begin to demonstrate that sanctions weren't effective. It seems to me sanctions were instrumental in Rouhani being elected, in the nuclear deal being agreed. Of course, the terms of the deal permitted a country to pull out, but it seems to me that what has happened subsequently with um, U.S. sanctions being reopposed again <coughs> demonstrates the absolute efficacy of sanctions because when U.S. sanctions are snapped back, there is an enormous effect. Anyone who has started trading with Iran has immediately ceased doing so. So another demonstration of how sanctions work. Mm. All right. Um, I've got one, uh, time for one more question. If someone's got a question. Yeah, lady here, and then we'll run up. A minute. One minute. Minute, minute, minute and a half. This is a question specifically from, from for uh, Mr. Campbell. Um, how does one target Putin himself? Um, because the alternative, it seems to me, is, is force. And as you mentioned, the UK is not likely to invade um, Russia. And also, I don't mean to be callous, but um, it seems that in an age of we where we have weapons of mass destruction, um, invading other countries and dropping missiles on them seems to perpetuate a greater humanitarian crisis than some sanctions indeed will. Yeah, what, what's going to hurt him? Well, the, 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 the point I was making, I wasn't, when I say target, I wasn't talking about you know, doing to him what he did to the guys in Salisbury. I was meaning that in terms of the diplomatic activity that took place. I'll give you an example. I thought, I thought when Theresa May uh, first met Putin after the this, this Salisbury event. I mean, she seemed to think that if she looked very, very stern <laughs> in the photo call with him, that that somehow was going to make him feel <coughs> terrible. And of course, what it does, it, it signals to him that he's even stronger. So I think you have to, I mean, diplomacy, Alistair rightly talks about the importance of diplomacy. I think uh, one of the, the things I fear most about the B word, Brexit, is actually that we're going to lose a substantial part of our diplomatic power and strength. It does have a value. And so when you, P Putin, for example, at the moment, he's desperate to get back into, into the G7, that it becomes the G8 again. We w should have been very, very clear from the word go, it's not even on the agenda. So what, what I think happened was that people thought, and I'm not saying, by the way, that these oligarchs, as criminals, shouldn't be, shouldn't be pursued. But don't pursue them pretending that it's about this broader political objective, which is about trying to punish somebody like Putin for action that he takes, when actually I think that is a classic example of something must be done itis. Okay. And I don't believe that it achieved... I don't, uh, they weren't clear about what the objectives were, and it, you know, as far as they were set out by, the, by the, the government, they weren't achieved. He's even stronger than he was. All right, look, we, I want to hear um, sort of a minute, minute and a half from each speaker now. We'll do a reverse order. We'll start with Ben in just a second. But, but right after this, I want you to vote again.
Uh, and just to remind you uh, where we were pre, uh, fours were 59.3, the against were 40.7. Um, that's where we were before. Uh, ben Emerson, uh, you've got about a minute, a minute and a half to, to wrap up. And, think, and start voting whenever you want. Well, I'd listen to these guys first. But, but, but then <laughs> okay, so start the, your vote. The, the issue here is not the need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Recognizing that the current sanctions regimes are not fair and effective does not involve saying that there is no role for sanctions to play in the resolution peacefully of international disputes. The motion is not, could sanctions ever become fair and effective? Uh, could they be reformed in such a way? But are they today fair and effective? Well, I in answer to the central thrust of what Maya has to say, there have been reforms in the Al-Qaeda and ISIS sanctions regime to introduce an ombudsperson, but nonetheless, the current situation remains a, 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 an opportunity for states through political diplomacy to add people to the list for their own political purposes or even, as the uh, House of Lords in this country uh, have held, to use listing as a convenient means of crippling dissidents and political opponents. And that's the high watermark of due process because none of the other sanctions regimes, the country-specific sanctions regimes operated by the United Nations, even have an ombudsperson. And can I tell you this? There are many instances, or at least a number, in which people have successfully applied to be delisted from the UN sanctions regime using the ombudsperson's procedure only to find themselves immediately listed on another UN sanctions country-specific regime which doesn't even have an ombudsperson. It is a complete due process black hole. Right. Thank you, Ben Emerson. Uh, Alistair Darling. Well, you know, I don't think anyone would argue that we live in anything like a perfect world. You know, whatever you look whether it's wars, whether it's sanctions, failures in diplomacy, you can point to lots of them. You can point around the world to individuals that no one in this room would have you know, the slightest bit of time for. Uh, but that's the world in which we live. Now, my proposition is that if you, want, if you consider that sanctions are fair and effective, I said at the outset, I don't believe in every case you can possibly argue that. But I do say that you have to think long and hard about saying that <coughs> sanctions are so flawed that even if you take Ben's high point, at least should be parked till you sort everything out, where does it leave you? Well, it leaves you with diplomacy or, in the extreme, uh, the use of force. And I just, I just don't think anyone you know, sensible would do that. And if you put yourself, you know, if you were sitting in Downing Street, and who knows the way things are, one of you may be sitting in Downing Street uh, be before, so. before too long. Um, <laughs> well, we could agree on that. Um, but you, you, you You've got to look at this in a political way, I'm afraid, and that is that sanctions, my, my contention is they can be fair and they can be effective, but we, thro we throw them away or you know, rubbish them at our peril because the way the world is at the moment, I don't think it's diplomacy that's going to take its place. It's going to be something far worse than that, right. and I don't want to see it. All right, Alice Carroll. I mean, I think the, the problem with defending this notion that they're fair and effective is that if we give the impression that we're vaguely content with the status quo, I think it stops us thinking about the process of reform that is massively needed. Ben, I thought, brilliantly drew attention to the realities of the United Nations, its history and its current operations, as to why that is so difficult. And I think, I think it's been interesting to me that I don't actually believe that either Meyer or Alistair have given us a specific, clear, compelling, credible case where sanctions have effectively and fairly been implemented and it's demonstrably the case that the, that the policy objective has been met. So I, there may be cases, funny enough, when I was on the way here, I was thinking of all the occasions that we were involved in, different situations in, in government, trying to think of a case where I, you know, we did sanctions and you'd have to say it sort of worked. And I really, really struggled. I really struggled. Whereas I can think of lots of examples where I think soft power can be used and has been used effectively. And I just think we should be thinking about that a lot more than the easy go-to sanctions. And we're not saying <coughs> throw them out. Yes, have them as part of the armory, but use them much more sparingly than they're being used right now. All right, Maya Lester, there's your challenge. 
in your last minute and a half to come up with that answer? So de dealing first with fairness, um, a number of the points that Ben Emerson makes about the UN system are, of course, right. What it ignores is that the UN, because of the presence of China and Russia on the Security Council, has become pretty impotent when it comes to the imposition of sanctions. The key actors on the sanction stage are the European Union, the United Kingdom in particular, and perhaps separately in the future, and the United States. Both of those systems have detailed systems ensuring due process. The United Nations, to some extent, but is seriously in need of reform. But the sanctions regimes that the UN is imposing at the moment are not the significant sanctions regimes on the world stage. Dealing with effectiveness, it seems to me that Ben Emerson and Alastair Campbell are with respect a bit all over the place in terms of what are the alternatives. Because at one moment, the suggestion is, well, let's just wait. Well, why should we wait? When the purpose of sanctions is to prevent the financing of terrorism, the network of finance that supports ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Why should we wait? What are we waiting for? When the purpose of sanctions is to stop global corruption and when it's to stop narcotics trafficking. Again, what are we waiting for? And are we waiting for nuclear weapons to be developed <clears throat> more? So it seems to me the answer to let's just wait and do nothing is um, disastrous potentially. There's been a lot of Very emphasis quickly, on, on Putin's Russia, and it seems to me that Putin and his close associates are very, very um, hard hit by the imposition of, UN, of US sanctions. What the Russians want to access in the EU is access to new loans on EU capital markets. They are completely prevented from doing so, and anyone involved in the financial world will know how closely that has hit Putin and his associates. All right, thank very you. good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed to uh, all of our speakers. Um, I'm just gonna remind you, maybe a few of you are still, still voting now, I'll bring you the final tally in just a sec. 59.3 was four. Uh, for um, Meyer and, um, and Alastair on this side, 40.7 was against. Of course, I mentioned undecideds, but I just did the math, and that makes 100. So there were no undecideds. <laughs> I guess you didn't get that option um, <laughs> downstairs. Um, let's uh, let's pull up the final uh, the final scores now, if we can, uh, up on the screen. So you go. Uh, fours have gone up to 52.58%, 52.04 against a 42. Point whatever the rest is, 87. Um, there we go. No, 52.04. Yeah, you can see that. 47.96. Same, same, <laughs> <laughs> same, as, same as the bloody referendum. Same as the bloody referendum. Okay, you, 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 you pulled up a little bit this side. Okay, 51.52. I'm going to leave it at that. 51.52. You did pull up a bit. The motion, uh, I've got to say, uh, is carried this evening. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much to you for voting. Let's grab a drink outside. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Axel Threlfall with Reuters. We've got another impressive lineup to debate.